Welcome, everybody, to Parallax Sangha. Uh, this evening, it's our open session, and our guest is the fabulous Miss Raven Connolly, who has been around on the scene, like me and Andrew, for quite a long time, and uh, been variously a host on the Stoa, um, been involved with the Nordic Women's Gathering, um, been doing the podcast circuit she's been a guest on techno social a couple of times she's actually was also a guest on the uh on this with us when it was still the manifesto media academy i think and uh so she's back for a second time and the plan or the initial idea for the conversation this evening came from um conversations we were having a couple of months ago when uh, we were together with a bunch of us in uh, in france at the end of uh, september and Raven brought in this interesting new concept, um, which you refer to as autogynophilia, um, which I think is a Greek word, which is something like self-woman lovingness. Loving oneself as a woman, desiring oneself as a woman. And it emerged in the context of some conversations we were having around drag, androgyny, transgenderism. Um, uh, and I believe, Raven, this is a concept that's being developed by a friend of yours, a guy who's somewhere out in the States. And I think that's um, that's where we can begin this evening is just um, who is this guy and what is this concept? <laughs> um, amazing. Yeah, this is. Um, well, I just I have, you know, I have friends in high places or I just happen to live a life where I meet random intellectuals who are searching really obscure concepts and publishing books about them. Um, I met this guy at a uh, eco-sexual party and learned that he was writing a book on auto-heterosexuality is actually what he calls it. Uh, and this is, this is one of the leading conceptual frameworks for understanding transgenderism. And it's been actively suppressed, <laughs> actively suppressed. So uh, my friend who actually is an autogynophile, self-identified autogynophile, um, also like very smart and super autistic, uh, was trying to figure out what was going on with his experience and started looking on the internet to try and find an explanation and basically only found the kind of like standard trans narrative. Um, which bases this whole concept, this whole experience on gender identity rather than sexual orientation and says that if you feel this um, experience of being attracted to the idea of yourself as a woman, that you are a woman, that's your gender identity, um, which he found to be very unsatisfying. So he continued to research and dug up all of the stuff that was being looked at in the 90s um, in universities that was conceptualizing transgenderism as autogynophilia, which yes, does mean auto-sexuality is the um, sexual orientation that we have towards ourselves. Allosexuality is our sexual orientation towards the other. And these are two dimensions of sexuality that end up creating this multi-dimensional space of the expression of someone's total sexual orientation. So, this idea like really needs to come back into the conversation uh, around transgenderism. So that's part of what's prompting him to write the book. And then I got like a sneak peek to the manuscript. And because I'm like excited about it, I just started talking about it with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting, right? it, like it challenges this idea that's pretty um, common in mainstream gender theory now, which is that there's sex, like biological sex, sexuality, and then gender identity. And the three are completely separate things. And so your sexual body might be male, but your sexual identity might be female. And then your sexuality might be towards men or women. And there's no confluence between them. And a lot of the confusion and the, the you could almost say cultural hysteria around the transgender debates relates to people disagreeing over whether these categories are true. If it even makes sense to say that if gender identity is not tied to sexual body at all, then why do we still even talk about there being, say, masculine or feminine or male or female? Well, well, it collapses in under its own contradictions. And I yeah. found this interesting 
because it provides an alternative way of reading that matrix of sex and gender that actually yeah. the gender identity is intertwined with with the type of sexuality you have and how you feel in your body <laughs> is actually a sexual thing rather than something not sexual at all which is the case that's been made totally yeah yeah i mean uh there's this whole concept it collapses all of those all that kind of conceptual baggage that exists in the main mainstream kind of narrative around transgenderism um, into just sexual orientation. Um, all of the letters of the LBGTQ thing just get collapsed into basically auto auto sexuality and non auto sexuality. Like so many permutations that we're seeing, like furries um and transracial people all of this can be explained by one theory which is this autosexual uh expression that's basically being unleashed as a result of the uncorking of uh the sexual liberation movement that when sex can kind of open up into the public space autosexuals are free to express <laughs> their cross gender cross species cross ability cross racial identities without dealing with a bunch of social i mean they are dealing with a bunch of social weirdness like this is definitely disruptive to the social order but there's enough space to begin to experience and express the euphoric sides of having this kind of cross attraction um instead of having to just like repress the feelings which someone would do and I guess in a more conservative uh, society and uh, also experience like some of the good stuff because there is a euphoric side to all of this what we end up getting most of the social crap like from is the dysphoria the envy like and that's why we named this talk gender envy so much of what we're seeing in the social sphere and what we're paying attention to is <laughs> dysphoric experiences around cross gender or cross whatever identity. And that's just like a bunch of yucky stuff. <laughs> mm. so, so just for clarity, can we like really explore what this autosexual thing is? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, there's basically a spatial development to sexuality that's why we call it a sexual orientation and when you look at how our sexuality is kind of imprinted during our early childhood experiences there's this like kind of spatial plane because sexuality inherently involves dynamic so usually what we understand as sexual orientation is our relationship to the other so attraction this like energy of desire that we have that's sexually rooted is turned, the arrow of attraction is turned outward to an object. And like, God knows there's like so much philosophy about that. <laughs> this attraction to the void that is the woman, you know, um, that's an other attraction. And we just drop the name, the, the, the prefix for that, which is aloe sexuality, because it's so, common and normative to us this idea of attraction to oneself uh is a less well-known layer of sexuality but once we start to kind of think about it we can see that people have a pretty strong attractions to themselves women in particular as a gender are basically given a lot of social space to express their attraction to themselves this is like Instagram, you know, like <laughs> taking photos of yourself all the time. Like, I mean, even like cam girls, you know, like they're not seeing the guy behind the screen jerking off when they're doing that. They're seeing themselves on the screen, you know, <laughs> like their bodies, you know, this exposure of oneself, it's like a turning back towards oneself and one's own uh, appearance and presentation and sense of how you are in this auto erotic 
fantasy. I don't know if that made any more sense, but <laughs> um, you can detect it. So there's a, and, and, okay. And this is the part that's relevant for um, autogynephilia is basically in early development, sometimes our sexualities get twisted and our sexual energy um, rather than being directed towards another primarily can be turned towards ourselves. So the arrow shifts and that energy then is like a self oriented. Uh. Um, and you see the twist. This is, I mean, this is a very fascinating thing to me, this twist that can happen because with auto heterosexuals, you also see other twists in their neurological structure autism, ADHD, um, like OCD, these other forms of neurodivergence. Um, you also see in like uh, autogynophiles, like other forms of fetishism are more common. Um, bestiality, like these other- sorry, sorry, Raven, for a sec. Eric and Madalena, please mute yourselves. So Andrew, could you please mute them? Great, yeah. okay. So there's some kind of twist, you know, and this is how I understand it. I think a lot of this is a big open space for, for thinking, for thought. Um, and this concept and this, basically the creation of a new dimension in the way that we think sexual orientation allows us to, to begin to think of the, the mapping the, of, of this space, right? This twist, what this twist does in a multidimensional uh, sexual space. And that's why mm. I find exciting because it opens up a new place for us to begin to think these these implications um of sexual liberation and and perversion and commodity fetishism like there's all sorts of things that are happening in our environment that i think are also stimulating the creation of these alternative uh sexual identities um, well, it provides in my opinion a plausibly coherent theory for cross-cultural trans transgenderism without resorting on the one hand to complete paradoxes of logic that make no sense that if you feel a certain identity you are definitely that thing in the same way that someone who was born in that body is also that thing but also without resorting to the conservative naturalistic argument that this thing doesn't exist this is just a mental illness this is a form of delusion these people just need to be given therapy and trained to live in the bodies that they're in there's actually an affirmative stance within it which is uh okay so for example if i am autosexual i might be a heterosexual man but who is attracted to the feminine within myself and if mm -hmm. that attraction is of a certain threshold there might then be an enjoyment of presenting myself as feminine, which is often expressed in things like drag. Like I've done drag before. It's incredibly fun, incredibly liberating. Um, various tantric and yogic schools explore cross-dressing or exploring one's own internal feminine or, uh, or masculine. I mean, Jung writes about it in terms of the anima or the animus too. What seems to be fascinating is precisely because of the, the confluence of the technologies and the medical practices we have today, it's actually possible for certain people to reorganize their entire life, physical structure, life world around wanting to be in this alternative identity all of the time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, they direct it more and more of their sexual energy towards realizing this fantasy essentially um but yeah totally i mean this is i think that this is a truly culturally turning concept to popularize like i i, I really am very i'm very excited that it's coming out there like that we can begin to think in this way because i think it op it opens up a lot of uncomfortable and interesting questions about sexuality in general um because of the it, it makes it obvious that there's a fantasy world that we are in relationship to in our sexual experience and that also brings us into questions about the inherent nature of our 
of our sexual fantasy experiences. And the, the kind of typical um, attraction, allosexual attraction, you can pretend like you're, you're attracted to real people. <laughs> you know, you're like, I love this woman or I love this man. But we are often obfuscating the side of this that is actually projection and fantasy and storytelling and all of this fictional architecture that exists around our fantasy, ex our sexual experiences. And auto sexuality just makes this more obvious, I think, which is disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is disturbing. Um, but we are we are really facing things that are disturbing right now. Like that's part of what technology um, and the unleashing of sexuality is doing, both in transgenderism, but also in like BDSM, for example, yeah. and other aspects of um, sexual liberation. It's um, confrontation with some very strange things, and it makes sense that there's a cultural reaction against this, and we do have to really think differently, I think, to go beyond this kind of cultural tension that's being created from this. Yeah. And why is it that this idea, if it was being researched and thought in the 90s, has suddenly been made taboo or non-existent, as opposed to the more mainstream gender theory, which is identity is essence? Yeah, you know, it's real weird. It seems like... You know, I wasn't really around in the 90s, like in the academic kind of public intellectual thing, because I was like a kid, but it seems like there was a bunch of interesting conversations that were being had that once um, social media came into our world, those things just no longer were advanced. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I think I'm still like open, open investigation to that question, but for whatever reason, the transgender activists took this other stance. And my friend's theory about this is that um, the internal experience of not being recognized as your autosexual identity is for many people one of dys dysphoria. So if I go in a grocery store and somebody doesn't like treat me like I'm a man, if I'm a trans man, that might personally make me feel very bad because I'm striving to experience my life as this autosexual identity that is not the gender that I actually present as. So the, the defensive kind of, well, I am a woman or I am a man, I think is really coming from, these people are like wounded, you know? It's, it's, it's simply that there is a lot of psychological suffering that occurs in people who have this condition. Uh, and that's where they're speaking from a lot of the time, rather than having a cool kind of rational uh, calculation of what's happening to them and how to manage it, you know? Uh, Cause it's something to also manage. Uh. Yeah, and I guess if the mainstream cultural view is that this is a perversion or an illness, then yeah, you res you respond to that immovable force with a oh I forget I've got the metaphor wrong, but you fucking fight back. Yeah, I mean right. people have to make space for themselves to be here, you know. Um, definitely, there's. I mean, I've been traveling more, and I was just in Turkey, and it's like it is surprising to me because I've spent most of my life living on the west coast of the United States that there isn't so much of this around like transgenderism queerness like there's still places in the world where this is just not common culture and like us in these cities in the west we're like oh my god there's so many gays there's so many trans people like what the hell is taking over and then you go somewhere else and you're like oh <laughs> this is such a fucking bubble um but of course, that's what happens in the cities. Like cities have always been about sex, you know, that's just inevitable. And the freedom that we get from specialization just increasingly puts our energy into the exploration of sexuality. And we're at the edge of understanding sex as a collective, 
consciously as a group of people, you know, um, as a kind of common knowledge that can then be acted upon by those people within those communities. And that's pretty fucking cool, in my opinion. Um, and if we think about being at the edge of culture, I mean, I don't know when is the last time that was around this like widespread conscious understanding of sexuality. And I think if we can also do that from transgenderism, we can really move some shit around culturally speaking in terms of the kind of wedge that we're in for the culture war. You know, it feels like we're stuck, you know? It's like we're having the same conversations we were having like three years ago. <laughs> it's like, how do we, where's the earthquake that kind of like moves all this shit around and gets us to a new place? You know, I think that as a cultural speculator, <laughs> you know, I'm like looking at this idea and I'm like, oh, okay, maybe this is one of the ones that will get us, get us somewhere. If we can take that energy and do something with it, you know? Mm. Well, it reminds me, like I was always struck when I, uh, when I was in India and they just have a transgender cast who walk around and that's part of the uh, that's part of the culture. They're not always, not always totally accepted, and I've forgotten the name for it. But they they exist, and uh, and they beg, and they often do sex work. And some Indian friends of mine who were very like heteronormative guys were just like, "Oh yeah, those are the uh, the guys who dress up as women, and they live that way." Whereas for us, there's so much, like you said, there's so much culture war around it, or around is that even a legitimate thing, or if it is. A legitimate thing then it needs to be it needs to be everywhere it's like it is the thing that culture needs to grapple with and i think when i try to imagine or speculate if culture gets this right 60 years in the future there will be some kind of recognition that there is the um the normative you might say allosexual majority and then a transsexual, transgender, queer subculture, and they exist with a relatively deep degree of harmony between them without constantly being at war with each other. But the shame is that it just seems to be in both sides battling and confronting. Yeah, and I also, I do think that this is also a part of, of the larger gender war, which is also men against women. And, you know, normal normal but like women cis women also experiencing a lot of gender envy uh because they have some amount of attraction to themselves as men and then men also experiencing gender envy because they have some amount of attraction to themselves as women and this is also part of the fueling of the animosity between the genders because gender is i mean sex is this cut at this like foundational part of our being. And we have to grapple with the limitations of that. And it causes a lot of suffering. <laughs> We're like, Jesus Christ, like so many dimensions of suffering that kind of all originate from the same beginning. And now we have this culture of uh, desire. We've basically colonized the body entirely with technological tools that can allow the mind to decide what the body is. And people are pursuing the attempts to alleviate this break, this cut in sexuality that they feel. But I mean, everyone feels that it's, it's just an inherent thing. It's like, that's part of this, the struggle of being. <laughs> um, so now, yeah, now, I mean, with surgeries and stuff, I mean, like so many women are also experiencing kind of like age envy, like, and that's another category of, of allosexual, uh, of autosexual attraction is being attracted to a different age than you are, like being attracted to being like 18 or being attracted to being five, you know, or whatever. Like there can be this idea of oneself as a younger thing that also drives people to go get surgeries or, um, put on a little schoolgirl outfit and run around or something like that you know what were the different categories that you said you told me about like speak that there's like animal age other sex race, race. 
and amputees being attracted to uh, having your limbs cut off. <laughs> it's funny what you think of some of the uh, the popular movements in culture the the uh, like anti-racist <laughs> movement the ableist movement the uh, the transgender movement <laughs> we even got an anti-bestiality movement but there's loads of furries right oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there's so many furries yeah yeah i mean i yeah there's so much here there's like ridiculous amounts of material for thinking, especially when you bring in fetishism. Mm -hmm. Just like how, I mean, I can mostly speak from American culture because that's what I know, but so many people grew up with very deep relationships to toys and are now kind of attracted to them, you know, or like kind of attracted to cartoons you know, are like kind of attracted to the idea of themselves as a cartoon or an anime girl, you know, and have this experience of themselves in this erotic way, this like kind of romantic relationship with this like self-concept that came out of their relationships with these, these, these toys, these more than just a plastic thing, but like a story, a relationship, you know, with a character or a or a film, you know, we were, we've been inundated with media for a few generations now. And we're starting to see what the results of that are for people's identities and the things that they're attracted to, both attracted to like having sex with and everything else that comes with that, like romantic attraction, like affinity, like curiosities, all of this stuff, but also how that turns inward on the self. You know, if you're super attracted to aliens, then you look at yourself, you're like, no alien would love me. <laughs> I'm not an alien. <laughs> I don't look like an alien. Now I have this idea that I want to be an alien, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's a fascinating, it's fast. It's fascinating. Uh, what's going on with people. <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird, but yeah, it is like, I remember being, really surprised and fascinated when i was younger i discovered rule 34 of the internet and says that if it exists there is porn of it and so basically every single kid show that anybody ever watched or video game that they watched when they were young someone has turned it into completely hardcore hentai and there are pages, <laughs> pages and pages of it all over the internet everything you ever loved and cared about as a child Everything you think is precious and sacred, just defiled, you know, twisted and perverted. And I mean, transgenderized just... every single princess, Disney princess with a massive dick. No, and... they all <laughs> dicks under those skirts. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's disturbing, but it's also like, I don't know, I'm one of these freaks. So for me, it's an interesting time to be around. And and um, and also because I'm one of these people, uh, I feel like, like I didn't grow up with a lot of internet or even media. And somehow I also turned out with this. So I do think that maybe it's something, it's not just, any of these individual factors there's like it runs in families like there's there's all sorts of different routes to someone's autoerotic sexual orientation basically taking over that's his red tag so somehow managed to Cadell is I can <laughs> 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 Oh, um, yeah, 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 totally. I mean, I think if you're going to try and like, under, like, well, fetishism is one of the con concepts that I'm really interested in right now as well. Uh, and also this auto sexuality. And I think thinking both of those things is, and also I guess power and submission, all those things together, I think, uh, can re can really are uh, really helping me understand what's happening in our cultural situation rather than like what people say is happening but like 
how do these how do the mechanics of these things actually work you know um and also i guess it's demystifying like i feel a lot less threatened by all of this now than than i did when it, it didn't make any sense to me so um i think that's really important as well because i th actually think a lot of this stuff is mostly harmless really like people are really freaking out about a lot of it and some of it is extreme but a guy walking down the street with a skirt is like not that big of a deal you know <laughs> yeah it was interesting that like one of the points you made to me when we last spoke about um how there's lots of forms of autoeroticism or autosexuality that we totally accept and see for granted like so for example a woman enjoying wearing red lipstick or dressing up and showing off her cleavage or whatever and if you often like speak to women about why they're dressing up they'll say oh i'm dressing up for myself to make myself feel good and so that's totally normal we get this like feel good look at so gym culture is all about this oh yeah huge autoerotic thing going on with gym culture <laughs> yeah it's all self like self and maybe it is the advent of selfies as well like selfie really creates this autoeroticism because you are kind of creating these um low intensity erotic images of yourself every time you put post a selfie on instagram oh yeah oh yeah yeah oh yeah totally but i mean in a in a in like a typical heterosexual person um you would have other attraction to the opposite sex and autoerotic attraction to the same sex and this is like a metasexuality. So if you're a man, you're going to be the object that you're attracted to, that your sexual energy goes towards, is going to be a woman. If you're if you're heterosexual, but if you're kind of your sexuality is like coded typically as a heterosexual, your self attraction is going to be to a man, to to being a man, and and to men in general as well. But this is the repressed. <laughs> so it's like, oh, am I homosexual? Because I'm like attracted to the to me as a man, you know. And that kind of sometimes will ricochet on men that I admire or men that I'm like feel close to. Or what Bard says is like this: the the sexual act that exemplifies this is the gangbang, because the the men are together as a group. And then all of them are directing their sexual energy towards one woman who is the object of attraction for all of them. But in this way, they're, they're also like kind of worshiping their form as men. The phallus is kind of at the center of this like event. So that's, that's like the, the act that kind of rep represents the harmonization of those dimensions. Um, for a heterosexual man. But an auto heterosexual is going to have them be parallel. So like basically my attraction to, or a man's attraction to a woman, the same attraction gets turned inward. So there's not an attraction to self as man. There's an attraction to self as woman, but also attraction to woman. So a lot of auto heterosexuals, they'll have, same, they'll have a partner that's actually the opposite sex man a uh, trans woman will want to be with a with a woman but they're attracted to the idea of themselves as women so yeah and that's yeah and there's two types of transgenderism there's the auto heterosexual kind and then there's the homosexual kind as well um so that also exists and it's explained by different phenomena mm, what would be the explanation for that one um, basically, like, you see more of that in repressed societies where people can't be gay. Yeah. So uh, instead, they transition. And they're often like, so, you know, men go through this process of androgens flooding uh, their fetuses in utero. And that is like the masculinization ex process for the embryo. And depending on the birth order and all sorts of other 
things, environmental conditions, men end up with varying degrees of masculinization. And masculinization is like part of what prompts this like diversification in men, diversification of form. Like there's a lot of weird things going on in men because of this. And what you'll have on one side is homosexual uh, autogonophilia that comes from men who don't, who don't have high levels of androgens in utero. So they end up kind of feminized because they haven't gone through a full masculinization process. So they're like, you're like beautiful boys. They have like fine features and they look feminine. They act feminine. They're like attracted to men. They didn't have enough of this androgen in utero to prompt this literal physical masculinization process. Autoheterosexuals, on the other hand, tend to be on the other side. You know, my friend, for example, is like six foot five, huge shoulders, like man, you know, or men who have like really big beards, you know, they have all these secondary sexual traits that are associated with like extreme masculinization of men. And same with this auto heterosexuality. So it's connected, you know, to androgens. It doesn't explain everything, but you can map on some of the incidences of these things onto the patterns of um your exposure to androgens in utero for men the women thing is like much more weird like why that happens to women that they want to be men you know um. weird in a way that can be explained or is it like is that a whole new level like of multifactorial yes Same with bisexuality you know there's like a bunch of stuff that kind of leads to bisexuality um and for like, you could speculate that some of the, some of the transgenderism for women is actually not really authentic. It's more of a like mimetic contagion that like, or, you know, is being like socially amplified because of some of the characteristics that girls, young girl, like younger girls have because of being female. Um, and then there also seems to be a, strong cultural preference for young girls to masculinize themselves in behavior and interests and um, play like boys. And then a lot of grown women are also attracted to being men in some way or another. And that seems pretty like, that seems like almost artificially constructed, you know, like there's a lot of energy going into people making women more masculine like ad campaigns you know op-eds <laughs> like whole film industry like this is definitely a something that people are invested in so it's hard it's kind of hard to tell what's going on there entirely oh girl boss thing yeah girl boss yeah. Why, why, why do you think this has become such a big thing in American culture in particular, from which point it's kind of rippling outwards? America's super gay, man. <laughs> <laughs> why is this coming from the US of A? Um, I think that uh, the United States has just been going through a process of like severe kind of like cultural mutation um, because of being in a state of decadence and yeah, there's a, there's a fetish around freedom. That's super true. Andrew brings that in from the chat. Um, so some of the cultural values around individualism. So you see in individualistic cultures, there's more of a prevalence of auto heterosexual expression. So it's actually a pretty good indicator of how individually free a society is. Um, so that experience, oh, that's interesting what Thomas is saying uh, in the chat. Um, yeah, so the ripping apart, yeah, actually of boundaries here of like the kind of unleashing into the public, the ritual sexual space, because I think of this as being in relationship to also the BDSM movement 
um, and the gay liberation movement. They're not exactly all the same thing, but they kind of all come through in this wave of energy uh, together around unleashing sexuality into the public sphere. And this is only accelerated by the internet. Um, so, you see, you know, San Francisco was like the, the center for like the creation of, uh, you know, hardcore pornographic content in, in the 80s and 90s and, and uh, fetish and bondage and BDSM and all this stuff. So some of this is just a result of the kind of other cultural historical things that are from the United States, like social media and um, other cultural ideas that everybody has to deal with, you know, <laughs> but really come from this very strange culture that's going through some very strange things at a very particular time. Um, but it's also not surprising to me that when it comes to Europe, it goes to places um, like Berlin or Amsterdam or London, like places that are already uh, cities that have a long sex culture. Uh, like I said earlier, sex is something that's always in cities. It's always being traded um, where there's ports. It's one of the things that's desired you know so anytime there's trade there's also sex trade and you could say maybe sex trade is like one of the primary forms of trade that we even see over human civilization but that desire is there so it exists in those cultures so of course we're seeing this being expressed and explored in the cities um you know it's just part of the culture we went through a weird period you know in the 20th century we're like we're gonna clean up the cities and like nice rich people are gonna live there and it's gonna be nice and you know now we're like oh it's back to being grungy and filled with sex and perverts <laughs> <laughs> cd and dirty and dirty and messy and there's perverted shit everywhere <laughs> anyways you know it's just what i've seen or think and yeah, and that point that Thomas brings in about and the collapse of ritual time and uh, ordinary time is pretty interesting. I don't know if Thomas, you're there, you want to unmute and explain that in greater depth or if we should just kind of riff with that. Um, yeah, we can project. Yeah, um, sure. I, I can uh, I can say something about that. Hi, Raven. Hi, hi Owen. Um, hey. Yeah, so so in if you look at the traditional anthropology, right, and there's a, there's a uh, there are kind of two times people live in two times. They have times of prohibition, where there's a lot of things that are not allowed. You're you're not allowed to have sex. You're not allowed to to exchange goods and stuff like that. So and that's to regulate desire, right? But this, of course, comes with a problem because if you have prohibitions all the time, then you get stuck, right? I mean, if you can't have sex, then how do you find a mate? So. There's ritual time. And in ritual time, all the normal prohibitions, they are inverted. Suddenly, the things that are not allowed in ordinary time, they are allowed. But that's dangerous because then you, have, uh, you also have conflict, right? If you break all these rules and you do dangerous things like sexuality. So what do you do? Well, in ritual time, you project all the conflict on a scapegoat and you slaughter the scapegoat. So that's why you constantly cycle. And this is basically what, what Nietzsche was, was on about with the eternal recurrence. I don't think he realized himself, but it's the eternal cycling between times of prohibition and times of, of ritual. And it seems now that, that we have a complete dissolution of boundaries between ordinary time, uh, times of prohibition and, and ritual time. And it seems that people want to live in, in, uh, in ritual time all the time instead of, instead of having clear boundaries. So that, that's just my five cents. And it would be interesting to hear what you... Uh, what you have to say about that or what, what your opinion is on that. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting way of seeing it and uh, matches onto uh, this framework. One of the things that uh, my friend emphasizes in, the, in his experience is actually the management of this desire. So for him, he's actually like, because there's this whole pattern around Let's say you 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 put on a dress for the first time and you're, you know, you're attracted to being a woman and you're a man and you put on a dress. You're gonna have this huge, the huge gender euphoria experience, but eventually it wears off. So like the patterns around the euphoria that you receive from leaning into this identity have a kind of half-life. 
So it, it, the same sorts of patterns that we have when we're forming a relationship with another person, like the new relationship energy and then it plateauing and then declining and all of the challenges of working through these ecstatic states that we can get in from experiencing sexual gratification also apply to the gratification of one's cross identity, cross sexual identity. But because it's a self identity, you need to have the capacity to regulate, you know, and when you're in a relationship with another, they can also work with the tension that allows you to regulate the, uh, the way that you step into this ritual sexual space. But when it's something that's only regulated by your own desire, then the friction becomes like society or whatever money or the, the you know, whatever it is that stops you from being able to just fully indulge in this gratification, the self-gratification. Um, but if you do that, you end up being pushed to extremes really quickly. And now people are basically alleviating all the friction to people being able to gratify this, this thing extremely very quickly by like going all the way into surgery without very much thought or consideration or going all the way, you know, into taking hormones, whatever it is to begin to gratify this, this, this feeling. But then you get to the end of it and you're like, Oh, I just played that all out. <laughs> you know, like it's no longer the same relationship anymore. Um, so, and I think that maybe we would even say that that's this is part of a process that's happening with, you know, other more normative kinds of attraction as well. People uh, like kind of using each other for these uh, these ecstatic experiences, but then like wearing out their I guess even just their neurotransmitters in terms of how they are experiencing pleasure. You know, they lose the capacity to experience high levels of pleasure because they're just like pressing the button all the time, something like that. I think it's interesting to think again about the, um, the Indian uh, transgender cast um, in the context of what you both have just said. And um, because it seems at least if we're going with Thomas's theory that the transgender cast again i've forgotten their names do live in ritual time all of the time but the majority of people don't live in ritual time and there's quite a high cost for crossing over from being in normative society to being in the transgender thing but it still exists there and they do look after as i said um a bunch of the sex work and they do i think often have their little um their ashrams presumably where they do spiritual work so it's like a little cult that's off the side of the mainstream normative culture but the normative culture is still very much based on prohibition and traditional marriage and values and so on and so forth whereas what seems to be going on in the west is just this almost war where the the transgender androgynous caste is trying to force its way into ordinary time and say ordinary time should reflect this at all times. And with a kind of desire probably to not ultimately be othered and to be scapegoated themselves and to be seen as um, perversions, as, as things that are wrong. But until the, we can build up a kind of normative culture that has ordinary time they are still able to hold the exception on its core that can conflict is probably going to continue yeah i think so <laughs> i don't know if thomas has any thoughts about that indian cast um yeah i think alexander bart talks about this right that there's a um, there's a certain percentage of people that um that are, are belonging to the shamanic caste that, 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 are, that live there. But for most people, this is not possible. And I think they're, they're uh, so it's, if you look, at, if you look at, um, at, at tribes, then you have shamans, right? Who, are, who have that specific task to, um, to, um, to um, facilitate the transition between ordinary time and ritual time. But that's not shared by the by the majority of the tribes. They have very fixed roles, and these fixed roles they also serve to keep desire in check. Because if you don't have a fixed role, then you just start competing with everybody, right? And and uh, so Owen, we've been talking about this with uh, with Daniel Fraga a lot, right? So we've we've cross-linked everybody on the internet without without a clear role. 
So now basically we have rampant competition. Everybody is competing with everybody because there is no fixed role and there's a high amount of, of, uh, of, um, of connection. And, and so, so, so these are very interesting anthropological times, I would say. Mm-hmm. Indeed they are. Mm-hmm. Andrew, yeah. do any thoughts, man? Well, what I was thinking about through all this is that, you know, this desire for there to be the, the circus to be happening all the time, right? It's the yeah. inversion of the it's the inversion of the world, right? Because the circus is supposed to happen on holidays or you know, in exceptional moments. And uh I was also thinking about how this, what you call, you know, autosexuality, people falling in love with their own bodies. And, you know, there's one way in which this is, is a, there's a transcendental aspect of that, which is kind of yogic, right? Which, which, uh, which is, is, is about, is about being able to experience pleasure and bliss in yourself without, you know, needing, compulsively needing to rely on others for that. Uh, so there is there is an enlightened aspect of that, but there's also a purely narcissistic aspect of that, which is is the negative side. You've been talking about this breakdown of 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 all, all the boundaries and borders, you know, into just just kind of the the, the circus. Um, oh yeah, yeah, totally. So that's, and that's, that's kind of my. And, and also, I was thinking. Sorry, America. last last comment, and then I'll let you riff on it. Is that okay? The breakdown is is the breakdown within ourselves. It's it's not just a break is is reflected completely in the breakdown of society. So it's it's auto auto uh, auto sexuality is is that's all the categories breaking down within ourselves as well. So it's as above, so below, as you know, as they say in alchemy. Sorry to uh, go go ahead and, and comment. No, on, no, yeah. as, as as above, so below is a good. It's true. Yeah, this is, it's hard to say which direction this is happening. Um, if it's these people are causing this rift or the historical, well, technological, social times are creating this abundance of people be, as some sort of social immune system, who knows what this is for ultimately. I mean, I guess that's the story that we're writing as well. What do we make of this rupture? in 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 the passage of of these of this eternal recurrence like what do we make of these times what do we make of the circus um i think well, i would call it apocalyptic i, I would say that <laughs> it's apocalyptic true. you know yeah. i'm not I don't mean in a negative sense because the word apocalyptic means the revelation of everything because uh -huh. everything is just absolutely every kind of uh, behavior and uh is being revealed it's like what owen was saying about porn right everything's there the entire demonic spectrum and also angelic spectrum of, of human society yeah oh yeah definitely we're really f having to face all of what we are which yeah, is nicely put difficult, yeah. difficult experience um very threatening in all sorts of ways you know uh it's yeah it's intense so yes anthropological pragmatism i love that yes exactly exactly yeah i don't know whether or not it's good or bad but i'd like to just watch and see what's happening and totally i would say that the united states is like a big circus which is this is just happening 24 7 and this is the essence of the culture like it's um you know where i grew up it was the common culture this was just normal. I reacted against it to feel edgy and cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got into the rest of the world. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> this is really weird what's happening in this place. Um, and is it going to happen to other places or maybe not? I'm not sure. It's certainly trying to breed, you know, everywhere. Um, this, whatever you want to call it, sexual liberation, just... Um, the lot desire unleashing thing um, the greatest show on earth yeah. yeah yeah i agree with that greatest show on earth thing it certainly looks like to the outside wow. that america just is a circus a continual it's circus it's a big circus um yeah but the, also, the next freak is the normative freak is also become a freak it's like everybody's become a freak so like oh, yeah. the the straight guy, the Jordan Peterson guy, the church going guy is that's become a new kind of circus character, right? Oh yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. You know? It's a freakifying of everything. You know, like it's the medium. It's it's just this is like the confrontation that we have with the times that we're in, the way that our identities are being framed now um is 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 just by nature this way it feels and self fetishization like really like turning that objectifying structure of the mind towards the body and knowing that we can kind of do what we want with it i mean if you have enough money you can really alter your body and in a way i feel like the purest form of this trans construction is actually in trans species which leads you towards other kin you know people who identify as non non-animal creatures non-human yeah non-human creatures because they are non-human you know in some ways i mean people have become <laughs> subhuman <laughs> you know so yeah i think that this if you just see it in relationship to what's possible now technologically, it's it's really not that surprising that people are filling that space, that that desiring space that's created by people offering the alterations of of bodies through technology. I mean, it's and in a way, this is, um, yeah, it's just. Yeah, I mean, like what Tom is saying, it's just like more body modification, right? It's just like elaborate stories mm -hmm. around why did how we can justify body modification. <laughs> um, so, well, I guess that's true. That I mean, if you look at all the different uh, tribes that existed in the beginning, there were there was every kind of variation of expression that you could find. So we're kind of moving back into that pure tribalism in a way, right? Which is the yeah. danger that the Thomas is talking about, but it's but it's also it's also the primordial human state, you know, to be completely experimental and all of these big structures of how we've been organizing ourselves are sort of not working anymore. Like yeah. marriage and yeah, yeah. marriage. <laughs> oh, and like the 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 ecstatic or transgressive rituals of the 20th century. I think this is one of Thomas's points, like the sports and the nightclubs and the rock concerts just don't really scratch the itch anymore. There's an effort to, certainly with sports, there's increasingly efforts to sanitize it and make it middle class and polite. Um, <laughs> like rock music, it's just the same old geezers in their 70s playing the big stadiums. And then like, ecstatic shit happening in the real underground but that never makes it out of the underground and then in the underground there's very little um i think you might say sutric community constraint around it and so the underground is just riddled with drugs yeah. in a, like in a, in a dangerous way like not in like a like a productive long-term way no people are you know self-destructive it's like when I realized that like a lot of the scenes that I have been part of, uh, it's escapism rather than it being like ecstatic ritual space to then return to normal time, supercharged. It's just escapism. It's I hate normal. I hate my job. So then I go and do drugs a weekend long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of defiance in those in those cultures but I, you know it's hard it's hard for me to be critical of of this group of people of the circus freaks like fully because i feel like one you know like so it's 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 like i'm one of these freaks and i want to live in the gutter all the time and like i want to be like in this environment so i feel like <sighs> what, I think what, the point is though raven that it's da it's a dangerous space and that's why you like do that. it and that's what you like. That's what you like. And that's why you that's why you want to go there. But it's, but it's not for everybody, right? You know, it never no. should be it shouldn't be for everybody. And yeah. we're kind of marketing that that's that for everybody. And it doesn't really work. That's how it feels like to me. Yeah. We are we do seem to be marketing that, but at the same time, it feels like envy is just this inevitable aspect of our existence you know like somebody who's normative is has this chance of looking towards a freak and be like oh i wish i was the freak you know 
And the freak looks towards the normal person and is like, oh, I wish I was normal or whatever. Or I wish normal didn't exist so I didn't have to feel envious of it. I guess that's more of what they think. <laughs> They're like, let's abolish normal so I don't have to feel like I'm missing out on something. Um, well, I guess envy is desire, is it, is it not? I mean, that would be the Girardian position. Envy itself is it's the hidden desire that nobody wants to admit to, but maybe you know, admitting to it and coming out to it and, and seeing it and is, is a first step for a culture to, you know, notice its own envy or. Oh, yeah, that's big. That's a big developmental thing to realize mm -hmm. envy inside of yourself to identify it and to begin to understand how it operates as this cultural social force. Yeah, it's super yeah. powerful. We're coming up to an hour, Owen. Should we open this up to questions? Yeah, yeah for sure. That's what I was about to say. Let's get some uh, some input from the audience. If, if no one's got anything, then I'm going to choose someone. So um, don't hold your tongue. <laughs> Quinn's Quinn, got his hand up. Quinn's so got Quinn. his hand up. Yeah. Quinn, my buddy. Quinn. Hello, Raven. Hey. <laughs> well, this was fun. Um, what a what a wonderful topic. I, I have a bunch of questions and thoughts. My first one is. To what extent do you think the erotic charge of these fantasies is related to their transgressive nature? Do they necessitate some sort of prohibition from the other in order to transgress against? Would be my, would be my first question there. If that makes sense. I certainly think that's part of it an aspect of it for sure but then once again i would also just point to the rift inherently that we have as from sexuality um itself which is you know even if you go through extreme surgery to get breasts and to you know get a fake vagina like you're not a woman and yeah it's it's, it's like it's kind of like if if there is total permissibility, like now you can fuck whoever you want, you can do whatever you want. Like, it's almost like something like transgenderism is a way of being in contact with the impossible, of, of having some sort of sexual inclination that leads you towards something that can never be fulfilled. It's like always a, like a, you know, a lack. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it seems like this line of thinking as far as I can tell, it kind of, <laughs> it like affirms the, it for, it affirms the primacy of the cut. It seems like so much of the confusion nowadays is the confusion between the, the cut of sex or subjectivity and the fantasy and the desire to kind of close the gap between the two. And then the realization that, oh, even, even getting, even changing underlying biology, there's still some, there's still something that some dis-ease that persists there. Like it's, it's not this final solution. And maybe there is something about ritual time that allows people to play seriously in, in the space of, of fantasy um, without confusing it. Yeah. For the, for the ritual time, like there's some continuity of, identity that is needed in profane time in order to to interact within the fantasy ritual space without losing oneself completely in over identification and then you're and then you're just psychosis you need to enter psychosis i think yeah it's pretty nice to go home and like go back to your being your normal. <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> nice um <laughs> <it's> cool <laughs> was a dragon for like the last two nights and now right. I'm back to my day to day life. Um, right. I think that's satisfying for most people. Yeah. You can never go home. What do you mean, Andrew? Oh, when you're fully, yeah. When you go all the way. Yeah. I was, I was being humorous a little bit. Like you're being funny over there. Kind of. Yeah. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like, like, I think that once you go beyond a certain point, though, there's no return, uh, you know, to your normal existence. There's, there's a point of no return. That was oh, kind of, yeah. my, For my, sure. my point. Absolutely. Right? 
Yeah. At some point you're like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen here, but, but our, our lives are filled with those moments of different, of, of, of other qualities too. You know, it's like an inflection point. Um, it's one that is very self-imposed by these, by people almost created by their own choices. Um, it's an expression of individual will, you know, of like, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to go and present as a woman after having been born and raised and lived as a man. I mean, it's a pretty radical, I think it is a radical thing to do, um, to choose for oneself. Uh, but yeah, it's, you never go home then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No going back from that. I think Dimitri has a question. Dimitri. Yeah, what's up? I, I have some big uh, unanswerable questions. Great. And I think that's the nature of this topic. You know, sex is never <laughs> going to be something we solve. <laughs> Neither on the societal level nor on your individual level. Um, of course, you can have a better or worse sex life. But with every installation of some sexual normativity, like Quinn already pointed at, uh, basically its enjoyment is going to be defined by the way it is transgressed, right? And this goes in, in different ways, but the singular point to which this uh, enjoyment kind of responds is kind of the trauma of the fact that we can never solve this problem. So I think it's extremely important that we stay in touch with this dimension of, of the issue. And in this sense, yes, we have the, the, the old normativity is breaking down. If you go to Amsterdam, it's full with LGBTQ flags everywhere. It is kind of the new uh, normativity in a sense. And, uh, you know, in, in, once, you, once you go to these like woke LGBT communities, uh, yes, they do see it as preferable that you're not a heterosexual male. male. Uh, like if you're bi, it's at least a bit better. If you're a woman and bi, it's also better. You know, if you're a woman and heterosexual, it's all already a bit iffy. Like, oh shit, you've kind of been socialized into that. So my question is, is this I like because we've been talking about normativity and cultural things here? Um, is this distinction between alosexual and autosexual really some new normativity that we just immediately want to install with this idea of we're gonna? Uh, be the new problem solvers or should we just like take a step back and see like okay these are distinctions we can make they're very real distinctions and what's the nature of these distinctions how do they manifest in the world so I, that's basically the questions i want to ask you uh, raven and owen I hope I was clear. Like the question, no, 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 no. you lost yeah. me. Like at the last part, like what the question itself. You, you, you created two. Like yeah. So I basically, like we can decide to go with alosexual and autosexual and make it a new, new kind of normativity or whatever. Uh, like okay. Re break free from the confines of both the LGBT normativity and the like normative normativity, the conser conservative ones. But I think it's more preferable to just like basically ask the question of like what if we just make these distinctions and what can we like learn from it? So what do you think about it? Should we install these? Like, should everyone know about what is alosexual and like give I everyone think, awareness about this? I think basically everyone in the world should know exactly what I think at all times. So because I think this, I think everybody should. And I'm American. <laughs> so like obviously what I think everybody else should think. So I mean that's why Amsterdam is now just like a colonial outpost of of uh, the rainbow flag of the USA, right? <laughs> um <laughs> uh no, obviously we should just use this for ourselves so that we can feel cool um and edgy and like we know things that other people don't know. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm being humorous. <laughs> Do you have anything to say, Owen? <laughs> I, I find the I find the concept um incredibly pragmatically useful at the very least. I think the moment you explained those to me the other day when we were in France, I was like, uh-huh. There's actually a a coherent explanation for why transgenderism exists as a cultural phenomenon, why um, some people are go into it and some people don't go into it, 
it completely cuts out all of the nonsense around sex and sexual sexual uh, attractiveness and gender identity being three concepts that never the three shall meet. So I would be willing to run with it as a uh, as a working hypothesis. Of course, it doesn't explain what the genesis of the different stances is, like why one person would come to be more allosexual or more um, autosexual. Um, I guess the Freudians would suggest it would be an eatable thing. The Gerardians would suggest it would be a mimetic thing. Um, but I think just from a moment in culture when it seems like the transgender phenomenon exists and isn't going away, but the arguments that the trans and LGBT community make for their own existence are so ridiculously nonsense, then something like this, which provides a lot more conceptual clarity, um, I will, I will run with it. Yeah, I think it's definitely something to just run with and see what happens. One of my issues with this theory is that, like, I'm still not sure if this all can't just be explained by fetishism. Uh, I know that I know that that's like somewhat offensive uh, to people who to autogynophiles because they, they feel like they have a really strong romantic connection to their autosexual identities. And so it does, it's not, it doesn't feel like something um, like, like fet a fetish, but I think fetishism is actually something quite, inter quite interesting and, and often just, uh, I don't know, I, I'm still exploring what this is a, for, for myself. And it seems like it shows up in a lot of different contexts, this like fetishization of things. And that that's also part of what it is to live in an industrial society is like commodity fetishism. I've been reading Surplus Enjoyment by Zizek. So my mind is just like getting all twisted these days. <laughs> it's like these perverted like loops and stuff. And he brings up commodity fetishism quite a lot. So I'm, yeah, I, I don't know. It could just be that it could be more related to this aspect of sexuality of, of fetishism, which is nothing new. I mean, fetishism is like a common thing. Poglia talks about men being more inclined towards fetishism. fetishism. Well, um, what is fetishism? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, <laughs> this is Only a good the question. impulsive ones, yeah. Um, maybe somebody could help. I'm trying to. I'm trying to under grasp this concept myself, but the the um, I think the basic understanding is it's like attraction to something as it's like an object. Uh, but I don't know. Somebody could maybe flesh that out. Like you can have a fetish, like a sexual attraction for like a rope or a foot like you kind of decontextualize the foot and make it into an object and then you have an attraction to the foot um or whatever it's it's like a perversion of an object get, there's different explanations right like the on my mind is i think in one of zizek's papers he writes about what fetishistic disavowal is as opposed to kind of standard repression being like repression would be um pushing down some aspect of the psychic experience that is unbearable whereas the fetishism would be the psyche attaches to a kind of absurd object that provides that kind of holds together its symbolic universe um and he gives the example of like there's a there's a movie where a woman where i think her husband dies and then she forms an intense attachment with the dog and doesn't ever grieve the husband and then the dog dies and then all of a sudden she's upset by this like completely overwhelming grief so there's i guess that theory would be that the fetish is some kind of object that there is a kind of perverse fascination with that sutures the impossible gap of living as a being um i think the gerardians have a completely different explanation for it which is that it's like a basically you keep desiring after objects until you find something that you can't actually possess and then you become totally obsessed by possessing that object ah well, maybe both can be true at the same time. I, I, well, see, here's the thing. I think battling it out between the psychoanalytic and the Gerardian explanations of this stuff is one of the big research areas of our community. Yeah, <laughs> conceptual worlds together and see what happens. Yeah. Cadell, are you there? And do you have any input on this? He might not be. He might be busy. Wow. Called out. <laughs> <laughs> profound silence oh wow yeah um 
Yeah, I don't know. I think fetishization is something that we have to look at to even understand our current global interconnected cybernetic computer human interface machine thing. It's like, what is driving that? I mean, it's like a total fetishization of, of machine, like men and their weird sexual perversions, like hanging out with their machines and like, you know, <laughs> tinkering with stuff. It's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I think that it's, it's, it's gotta be wrapped up in the situation somehow, just that the profound amount of like objects that we're inundated with. And, and of course, like the United States is a highly consumeristic society. We've pretty much had nothing holding us together for like two or three generations in terms of like substantial, deep, like ethnic ancestral values and have understood ourselves in relationship to consumer products and consumer goods and then we get the rise of lifestyle marketing then the self is basically being constructed by the individual in relation to images that they're being shown that make them desire certain um, lifestyles for themselves that are all represented by the objects that they end up reflecting their self-image in around them you know like when this is the cultural environment that you're in and it's actually being reflected in the physical world around you that's just being driven so much by fantasy um the idea that there would be a commodification of your gender is not surprising you know? i had a cool thought i wonder if i could pass by you raven um i was thinking that yeah because I like to study religious icons and symbols uh, a lot. And it appears to me that the religious symbol is a kind of fetish. It's like, this is what you use as a fetish. So the reason we don't, we have so much fetishism today is because we don't have, we're not working with religious icons and, and symbols, which, which used to take the place of that kind of fetishism, you know, you know, like St. Sebastian being um, impaled with arrows and, Cute and all kinds of different, uh, you know, uh, demons and and uh, cupids and it was all it was all within a religious co cosmology at one point. And when the religious cosmology falls apart, then we have like fetish for like shoes and you know uh, cartoons and all these other things, right? All these, all these, but what you would call um, I don't know non sacred about, things. Like, Rick and Morty is pretty sacred. So. No, well, sure, yeah. <laughs> No, no doubt it's sacred to you. Yeah. You know. <laughs> no, but I, I think you're totally right, Andrew. Like we seek images to channel our libido towards. And if I'm like a 13th century peasant and I go into my church and there's like a life-size model of a guy being crucified, like that's like watching a BDSM porno. Like that's there, oh, right? Sure. Like um <laughs> And then we've had the 20th century of, um, I mean, like pa like Paglia points to Hollywood and the whole fashion industry's music as being the like pagan sadomasochistic culture. But we seem to have reached a threshold point where those icons were so saturated by them that they don't, um, they don't tickle the itch anymore. But the only symbol that's got any valency these days is the Nazi swastika. That's the only like culturally universal symbol that people look at it and it produces a real emotional reaction. That and hardcore right. porn. Interesting. Yeah. That and hardcore it's, porn uh, and like beheading videos from ISIS and <laughs> soldiers getting crucified in the field and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that's interesting on you said like the, the oversaturation, I feel like that's important with the notion of, of fetish. Like there's something about, um, the distance between subjectivity and the object of its fantasy that has to do with with its fetishistic charge, you know, and you were saying, Raven, that eventually the fantasy loses its erotic charge once it's actualized enough times like it just it no longer it no longer kind of uh, let yeah, no longer scratches, no longer scratches the itch like once that mode of identification has gone through enough oscillation that just kind of dies you know and the the nazi myth or these sorts of things it's like that we have enough distance to them that they're there uh they retain their yeah their transgressive allure i guess 
But you want to know, get something really weird is like, so the Gerardian story of the etiology of religion is that everybody in the community kills someone who they all agree was guilty. And then a symbol emerges to represent the corpse of that person who they were killed, mm. which then unites the culture. What is the swastika but the symbol of the mm. person who everybody killed and everybody agrees is evil and guilty? The religion of the West is Hitlerism. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> slow Whoa. down there, Rowan. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. Okay, and the only people that actually cross the boundary and wear the symbol are actors. And they make films and they totally immerse themselves in those characters. And they have total... Esoteric Hitlerism is a real thing. They're only allowed, the people who are allowed to, you know, yeah. Yeah, they're the only people who are allowed to present that way. But can you imagine how fucking, like, crazy that would be for a normal person just to, like, plop them on a movie set of, like, a Nazi movie, you know? Which, like, America made a lot of these, you know? And so it's a it's, massive like, kink, too. Massive, like, massive kink. The people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, circus people make media. Yeah. Circus people sure. are the media makers. They're the ones who understand this other dimension of human existence, which is like a fictional dimension of, of role play and the mutability of being human. I think we were also talking about this within the context of confronting, you know, what is woman, right? Like this void femininity, the void that the, of this female identity of like a non-signifier, right? Like when you, well, I've been trying to think this thing um, and it's, it's putting me in a wholly different position in terms of, okay, well, what if, what if that, what is what woman is this empty thing? to purify oneself as a woman what do you become you know like empty right and but but then you become a vessel for all of this fantasy projection and some people just merge themselves with this or they become performers of this world they um you know they're celebrity stars that basically cultivate these projections onto them um and there's an art of this there's like a science of this it's it's yeah, I would say that's a religious thing, you know, it really is. It's that's where it comes from. Like even the movie stars and all that, it's 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 working with iconography, it's working with archetype, it's working with creating a a, a egregore, creating a specter, creating a an imaginary thing yeah. that people can work through to express what can't be expressed or what can't be seen or what can't can't be spoken in ordinary language. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but yeah, I mean, I was just thinking the other day, I was sitting on the turkey, you know, drinking some chai and they about celebrities that we all know. I'm being like, who are these freaks? Like, why do we know about these freaky, weird people? Like, they're so weird. You know, they're just some of them are just totally bizarre. But and yet people know about them. And like, it just it's a confrontation with a kind of world that if we were living in a different context, it would just be subterranean. You just would never know about the total freakish body modification people who get the horns put into their foreheads. You just wouldn't know about them. But now it's like I can walk past a magazine and there's one, <laughs> somebody on the front cover who's got like black eyes, you know? And that just is a, I guess that goes back to what Owen was saying. Like, you know, we're in a time where we're just confronting so much so many of the permutations of human experience that are all happening simultaneously on the planet right now but also all of the past that we can get access to um and even you know our attempts to imagine the future it's just all being uh projected into this moment um and that's i think a lot of what zizek is pointing out that because our point in history has changed history itself has changed our relationship to it and we're responding to that shift um and this is one of the ways that we can look at it uh through this through transgenderism through the way that sexuality has been unleashed into the culture and the effects of it in terms of creating new means and new signifiers for people to organize themselves around or not new ones 
just old ones that are like kind of stitched together. I think this question of creating new working icons for ritual is one that's quite close to my heart. Like actually how to do, I, I mean, some of you guys know, I've been thinking about this with you guys. It's like, what does ritual and art look like in the 21st century rather than just copying the modes of the 20th century? Yeah, I wonder if there's anything new under the sun or it's just everything. It's just the unbearable intimacy of the global village where just everything is coming so we have we have all of this material. Of course, you can you can there's permutations and you can you can put you can stitch things together and make something new, but it's still the same uh, same forms just repeating themselves in a different. I mean, I, what is the, yeah? What would be a novel a, a novel ritual anymore? I have no idea. Um, well, I think we can be certain there will be new media, even if it's just going more and more virtual. But then a a reaction to that which would be more and more physical mm. thomas has written tantra has just started to deconstruct the west um yeah nice. like i think <laughs> that's an interesting <laughs> stuff, stuff. yeah anisa has got something anisa has got something to say there and this yeah, will be the like, last thing i think because perhaps this is the, the final uh, question uh because it's almost we want to respect our time almost 9 30 again go ahead anisa yeah uh yeah i just think this is like amazing like um you were talking about how this new future kind of yeah how we can do it in the future and i think it's something that's growing organically in some places like like you said in amsterdam and berlin or where people are trying new stuff it's mixed with like ecstatic dance and then there's this like tantric workshops and then people are using the new and the old uh and then making up something new like um yeah, last Friday I was in a church and it was like where there was a lecture and then a speech and a dance and then music. And it was like a very kind of spiritual thing that's a mix of everything, uh, but still using that kind of energy of the church at the same time. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I uh, I don't have like a question, but I, uh, I really like when you said like we are at the edge of understanding sex as a community and as a culture. Um, and I think that that's amazing. Like, uh, yeah, we can we can like reach the level of fun as a species, you know, like like the Romans or like those great civilizations who like were able to to be like really great at what they do, and then they enjoyed a lot of fun and, and orgies and and food and like uh, and crazy games and crazy creativity that we are like uh, living in today, like like the sexual liberation, the the eros liberation. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, it feels like this, like we human beings have this like huge energy of desire that usually we're able only like to contain, like that's how we were able to like create civilization. We contain it and with all the sutra and the rules, but then sometimes we have to let it out like 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 a like a pipe, you know, have to like let it go like with some yeah, uh, with tantric practices, etc., or like in violence if we don't do that. Uh, but maybe today we are on the edge of this like new uh, new age, like new. Yeah, ontological times where we can make something completely new with it. You can like completely use that energy. Right? And I think that would be like amazing. Uh, yeah, if we can do that. It'd be cool. It's also profoundly disturbing. So we have to remember that as well. It's like very, it's a lot to face the the kind of change that is here, you know? It's here. And there's some people who are highly adaptable to it. I mean, I I think like hippies are a pretty like adapted group to the, the kind of remixing uh, that's necessary for moving into this era. And that's marked by high openness, you know, as a characteristic and a trait that's held in those cultures. Um, also, incidentally, hippies are now uncool because they're they're problematic because they appropriate cultures and they like masculinity and femininity. You know, they're not into vaccines and stuff. You know, so um, that's a, that's also an interesting twist, I think, uh, as we kind of watch the sports of the culture wars, who's 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 over and who's under in terms of what's what's happening. 
Yeah, I, I yeah. hope I hope that as well. I'm yeah, glad like, to hear somebody yeah. defend the hippies. That's that's kind of nice. But sorry, Denise. I ahead. can also talk shit. Yeah. So. <laughs> Whichever channel you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just want to say, like, it definitely is something that is spreading. And uh, like we say here often when we talk about Tantra, that it's something that's very dangerous, has to be like, you have to be initiated into it. You cannot give it to all society, uh, which is true. But uh, there's also now this like different levels of getting into this kind of, yeah, this uh, energy. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe it can spread to more people. I hope, you know. <clears throat> right yeah, on. I mean, I would say, uh, oh, you want to go ahead? Go on, go on. You finish that thought and then I'm going to cut it. And we have an after party so we can continue the conversation in the uh, in the after party room. So. Oh, there's an after party room. Yeah, there is. Oh la la. And you're invited. And <laughs> Anise post the link to the after. Anise post yeah. the after party. Like, Anise, make sure everybody gets uh, make sure everybody gets the link so that we can continue this conversation in a less formal manner. Okay, cool. Well, whatever. <laughs> Raven, did you want to say anything to wrap up before we close the uh, the official meeting? Yeah, I would. I guess my you know my message these days is just you know laugh more. It's not that his, it, there's nothing really to be hysterical about. It's kind. Of, I like how Thomas just reminds us that a lot of this stuff is just like classic human stuff. You know, it's nothing special. Um, and just to kind of de-escalate the the stakes, the apparent stakes of all this, it's like um, it's really sensationalized. And it's really presented in a very apocalyptic way. This whole the whole culture wars conversation, um, and people have an incentive to really provoke others to get agitated and freaked out about what's going on. And I don't think it's helpful for pragmatic anthropology. I think we really have to have a a grounded and open view that's interested really in looking at patterns rather than having, you know emotional reactions to what's going on and then also trying to just negate 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 you know as much as possible to try and see what's happening clearly and then just watch it you know we live here we, we're like on this planet for some time and might as well just watch what's going on and <laughs> like play the game like okay especially if we can figure out what it is like might as well that's my vibe <laughs> <laughs> Amazing and stuff. comedy let's make some good jokes about all this because we need to mock, mock so much of this ruthlessly i feel 